Those von Karsteins are very handsome. I don't think I'd mind being bitten by one of them. Did you see the one with the black hair and the scowl? From Elke Rabe, a camp follower attached to a baggage trade of Imperial Sturlander guards. Out of all the vampires that have ever been known to man, the cursed bloodline of the von Karsteins is by far the most legendary, handsome, arrogant, charismatic, prideful, and ambitious. The von Karsteins are the true aristocracy of the night. It is said that the history of the von Karstein family can be traced back to the time of Sigmar Heldenhammer and the founding of the Empire. Indeed, for in a way, there is some truth to this, for it was Vlad von Karstein himself that was present during that ancient time, giving Sigma vital instructions on how to defeat Nagash before the gates of Altdorf itself. Ever since then, however, it is believed by the von Karsteins that they have the right and legitimacy for Sigmar's realm as much as any other contender. Many nobles believe deeply in the concept of the peerage to its literal extreme. Nobility, in other words, is in the blood. The upper classes are placed above the lower because only they have the qualities necessary to rule, and these qualities can only be passed through blood. To the von Karsteins, this is taken to an even greater extreme. This is not least because of family pride. The family take their name and noble duties very seriously, and if they swear something upon themselves, they will move all the earth to see it through. Of course, herein lies the terrible contradiction. They consider their bloodline sacred, Yet because they are incapable of delivering offspring and the blood itself is simply considered enough to make one a member of their ranks, they are often faced with less ideal members that might possibly make a mockery of their name. The only solution is to constantly engage in internecine wars and power struggles so that only the truly greatest amongst their number are allowed to bear the illustrious name. Thus it is that the von Karsteins devote most of their lives to the twin obsessions at the heart of all nobility, conspiring to improve their status over each other and waging outright war. Perhaps the only way to unite these warring members is to find a common enemy, and perhaps the most common are those mortals that dare to still defy the ruling and greatness of the von Karstein family. I do not care what our prey thinks of us. Do you consider what opinion meat has of you? From Constantine von Karstein. Like all vampires, the von Karsteins are required to sustain themselves with a steady flow of blood in order to keep both their appearance, strength, and sanity in check. Without the consumption of blood, 
all vampires would either die or degenerate into a primitive yet savage beast. As such, the von Karsteins are known to be the only vampiric bloodline to be caretakers or landholders of certain human estates and small holdings with a literal populace of human cattle. Contrary to popular belief, the von Karsteins actually don't mind if they hunt for their prey, but rather, they find it insulting that they have to do it from the shadows and away from the prying eyes of the witch hunters. However, thanks to their astonishing good looks and great charisma, the peasants and nobles under their rule have been known to fight each other for the chance to be willing subjects to their feedings. For whatever reason behind it, those victims that are tenderly drained of their blood seem to enjoy a pleasuring sensation that would otherwise overcome the pain and fear of being drained of their blood. Also, like all vampires, the von Karsteins cannot bear any children and thus have to rely on transforming potential candidates into a vampire by means of a blood kiss. Such a decision is often frowned upon by the majority of vampires, as it is common for the descending bloodlines to become weaker of both will, power and strength. To keep to their image as the best of the bloodlines, even when a candidate becomes a von Karstein vampire, they must also embody the family's core values and characteristics. There is no point in passing on the von Karstein blood to one who will mingle with the common folk or not uphold the high standards of the family. The ideal candidate must be arrogant to the core, fundamentally assured of both his family's prominent place in the universe and his own. If this is not the case when the kiss is given, instruction will be provided and new vampires are schooled in every aspect of their noble life including strategy, manipulation, and conspiracy. Likewise, if the vampire is ever found wanting in his lordly skills and duties, he may be prompted to at least mind the honor of his family name. A von Karstein vampire is only given one chance, and should he continue to be a liability to the family, they are often never seen again. Although strict in their selection process, members of the von Karstein family are known to be erratic in passing the blood kiss to many candidates that have very little to no qualifications. Oftentimes, these members are known to give the blood kiss to stable boys or wenches just because of their dashing good looks. It is believed by the bloodline that eccentricities are the right and privilege of those with noble blood. A single vampire wench is an insult. A harem of them is an achievement. In short, when it comes to the blood kiss, as with almost everything in the life of the nobility, there is a great deal of propriety to be observed. But every rule can be broken if one is powerful enough that no one would dare to slight him. Surrender, 
and serve me in life, or die and slave for me in death. Vlad von Karstein, known in his former life as Vashanesh of Nehekara, was the first vampire count of Sylvania and the founder of the von Karstein bloodline. He was dreaded by many as the monster that brought darkness upon the lands of Sylvania after his marriage to Isabella von Drag, daughter of the late Imperial Count Otto von Drag. His bid for power and the desire to rule the whole empire as his own has ensured the, the total collapse of the Imperial province, as well as to herald the beginning of the first of the Vampire Wars from 2010 IC and onwards. Though his death signaled the end of the grueling conflict in 2051 IC, the lands of Sylvania have been forever cursed with the powers of the undead, becoming breeding grounds for a multitude of necromancers, vampires, and other dark creatures. As the years went by, the land was forever shunned by the other imperial provinces, and every century or two, another one of Vlad's own bloodline would rise up and challenge the Empire in hopes of achieving that which Vlad could not. His story began when Lahmia fell into darkness following Neferata's transformation into a vampire. Nehekara assembled a coalition to cleanse it. General Setep of Khemri, whose legion had conquered many distant lands, including some beyond Blackfire Pass, was foremost amongst this coalition. Amongst his soldiers was the masterful tactician Vashanesh, who was of Nagash's own blood. Betraying Setep, Vashanesh travelled to Lahmia to warn them of this planned attack. He so impressed Neferata, she gave him the last of the Elixir of Life, which none have been able to recreate since, and made him her husband, King of Lahmia and co-ruler of its growing population of vampires. Together they plotted to keep the other cities of Nehekara distant from each other, creating a network of spies that split the nation for centuries, disrupting all attempts to unify the people against them. After centuries of uncontested rule, it was King al Khadizar the Conqueror who finally managed to mobilize the disparate armies and bring war to Lahmia by invoking the names of the old gods of Nehekara. He laid siege to the city at the head of an army composed of warriors from all of the other cities, as well as the territories he had added to the realm, carved out of Araby and the Southlands. Arriving at the city, they were horrified to be met not only by the military of Lahmia, but also by an army of the dead raised from their rest by Vasora. Fighting back their fear, al Khadizar's troops brought battle to the undead. Though outnumbered, the army of Lahmia could be continually replenished, the dead rising as soon as they fell. Their mortal followers proved less reliable, and traitors among them turned against their masters and allowed the Nehekarans to storm the city. The chariots of the Jackal Squadron of Marak coated the streets with blood, and those vampires who did not flee were forced to do battle on the steps of the temple. Aborash led the defense for a full week, withstanding the spells of Zandri's high priests and the alchemical fire of their war machines. Finally, 
the temple was burned to the ground, and Aborash was forced to flee with several of his sons in darkness. The last of his compassion for the living finally burned out of him. They traveled far, and their slaughter of the orcs, of what later became the Badlands, is still famed. The other surviving vampires, including Neferata, Vesoran, Ushoran, Matmasiz, and Harakt, fled to the north, where they came across a reborn Nagash in the midst of raising an undead army of his own. It was no coincidence that the vampires came across Nagash. Through his agent, Vesoran, Nagash had manipulated them from the beginning and led them his magical aid from a distance during the Siege of Lahmia. When Neferata learned the full extent of Vesoran's manipulation, she was furious, even more so when Nagash passed her over to offer his distant relative, Vashanesh, a position as leader of his forces. Nagash had crafted a ring that would allow the vampire who wore it to return from the dead even more easily than they already could. But through that ring, Nagash would control all of vampire kind. Vashanesh accepted the ring, and at Nagash's command, the vampires led his army to Kemri. Although at first, the vampires were eager to serve as Nagash's lieutenants, to gain revenge on al Khadizar and regain Lahmia, it became apparent their survival was irrelevant to Nagash. He hurled them carelessly against the enemy as he would his mindless undead troops and he cared not for rebuilding Lamia, and sought instead to destroy all of Nehekara. Bound by the power of the ring, Vashanesh war, they were unable to disobey Nagash, or even his second in command, Arkan the Black. In a surprising twist, Vashanesh hit on an ingenious solution to the problem. Suspecting the control Nagash exerted relied on a living vampire wearing the ring, and believing the great necromancer's assurance it would return him from the grave, he allowed al Khadizar to cut him down at the height of a battle. The vampires were freed from their control, and only Vasoran remained. The others scattered to the winds after bickering over where to go and who deserved to lead them. Matmasis and Harakt vanished out of history, though there are rumors of vampires in Far Cathay and the Southlands who may be of their lost bloodlines. Ushoran settled in Strigos, Neferata traveled widely influencing the nations of man from their foundings and inserting her daughters in privileged positions amongst them. The Soran stayed by Nagash's side, whilst he cursed and ranted at the fickleness of vampires. Upon Nagash's defeat, the Soran took many of his master's writings and studied them with the aid of his acolytes and his apprentice, Melchior transcribing his notes in the dread Grimoire Necronium. His mastery of necromancy grew so profoundly that he was able to limit the red thirst that drove vampires to live dangerously close to mankind, though the effect of this change was to hideously twist his line's physical form. His reward for this feat was death at Melchior's hand. Vashanesh eventually returned as Nagash had promised he would, and he spent the next few centuries testing the limits of the ring. Even if Nagash had truly died after being abandoned by the vampires, which seemed unlikely, the ring had allowed Arkan to control them as well. Vashanesh set about mastering certain magical arts 
to make the ring his slave, rather than vice versa. During this time, he'd spent much of his time within the lands of Kislev, where he took up the name of Vladimir. Almost unnoticed in the annals of history, Vashanesh traveled to the land of Sylvania that he had first seen as a soldier in the legions of Setep, and calling himself Prince Vladimir. He aided Van Hel in crafting an undead host to defeat the Skaven who threatened the land in the wake of the Black Death. Content with this change he had wrought in history, he returned to hiding for another 700 years. When he came back, it was under the name Vlad von Karstein. Vlad von Karstein's rise. It began on a storm lash night, when Otto, the last of the mad von Drake accounts, lay on his deathbed in Castle Drakenhof cursing the gods that he was without a male heir to continue his legacy. He was a cruel man, fond of putting the heads of peasants on spikes at the slightest provocation, and when crazed with drink, he was convinced he was Sigma reincarnated. The nobles of his court had no respect for his authority, and paid no attention to his commands. Sylvania seethed with strife. As his family keenly awaited his final breath, Otto swore he would marry his daughter Isabella to a demon rather than let his hated brother Leopold inherit. Otto had already refused his daughter's hand to every noble in Sylvania, for he despised them all. No man of breeding from beyond the borders of Ondrak's realm wanted to marry a Sylvanian heiress, and so it was that when Isabella von Drake knelt at Otto's deathbed, she was still without a husband. Outside, thunder rumbled, and lightning split the storm-black darkness. Victor Gutmann, the aged priest of Sigma who had been called to shrive the old count, fainted away. Then, from out of the storm, came the sound of wheels and pounding hooves. A dark coach, pulled by four mighty black steeds, drew up outside the keep. A heavy hand smote the door, a ringing blow and a proud voice demanded entry. The castle gate swung open on its hinges before any man-at-arms could touch it. The visitor was revealed, and as one, the baying guard dogs ceased to howl and slunk away. The stranger was tall, darkly handsome, and of noble bearing and aspect. No one stayed his entry as he marched directly to the Count's chamber. The newcomer's accent was foreign, perhaps from Kislev, or even further afield. He named himself as Vlad von Karstein, and recited his noble antecedents to the Count. He then claimed the wide-eyed Isabella's hand in marriage, looking into the stranger's cold, dead eyes. The Count perhaps regretted his rash oath, but before he knew it, he had given his blessing nonetheless. The priest Gutmann was revived from his swoon and brought to the chambers of Otto, where the marriage ceremony was performed before the dying Count's bed. Almost as soon as the last of the ritual words were spoken, Otto von Drake died leaving his daughter and his entire estate in the charge of Vlad von Karstein. The new Count's first act was to hurl Isabella's uncle Leopold through the window of the highest tower of Castle Drakenhold. 
Vlad seemed as eccentric as old Otto. He never ate in the servant's presence. He never walked abroad by day. He dismissed the elderly Sigmarite priest and sent him from the town. No one ever saw Victor Gutmann again. Soon, many of the old servants at the keep were dismissed and mysterious, swarthy strangers took their place. However, the new count seemed less oppressive than the old one, and so the folk of Sylvania got on with their daily business, ignoring the hooded and cloaked foreigners that often visited the castle. Years of punitive von Drak rule had taught them not to question the deeds of their betters. All that concerned the lower classes was that at least the new count didn't order senseless executions or demand exorbitant taxes at a whim. No one doubted the count's prowess in battle either. When the famed company of Bernhoff the Butcher rode into town and demanded tribute, Vlad cut the veteran mercenary down as if he were a stripling. The Count then proceeded to slaughter the entire mercenary band while his bodyguard watched, picking their teeth and making smug comments. The Count's popularity was assured. Within his realm, the laws were kept and the guilty were punished without mercy. As the months passed, what had started out as a marriage of convenience developed into something far more. When it became clear that Isabella could not be merely seduced by his charms and rebelled against his will for the first time, Vlad fell instantly in love with her. Once in love, Isabella wished for the blood kiss. But Vlad knew the true suffering of the vampires and loved her too much for her to endure that. Scant days later, word reached Drakenhov that Isabella had fallen sick with an incurable illness. One of the physicians who tended her claimed her heart had stopped. The new count insisted this was not so. He dismissed the learned doctors, claiming he would care for her with his own hands. Three days later, she appeared in front of her folk, saying she was fully recovered. She was ever afterwards pale and wan, however, and never left her chambers save by moonlight. At first, none of the feuding nobles of Sylvania paid any heed to the commands of the new count. If this bothered Vlad, he gave no sign of it. The Count cherished his tenants as a peasant family cherishes a beast they are fattening for the midsummer feast. After decades of rule by Mad Otto, this new order was welcomed by all save the most paranoid. After several months, however, Dark things began to happen. Young men and women from the villages began to disappear. The living dead gathered at the borders of each settlement in growing numbers. These were small forces at first, and they came after only those who disobeyed the Count's authority. If any rebellious Sylvanians escaped the clutches of the undead, then they quickly fell victim to strange accidents. Only those who had sworn allegiance to Vlad von Karstein seemed immune to these depredations. Soon, the renegade nobles of Sylvania were queuing up to swear fealty to him. Within ten years, Vlad was more firmly in control of unruly Sylvania than the Elector Counts were of the largest states in the Empire. Some remarked that such was Vlad's success as a ruler, he should, in fact, sit upon the Imperial throne. After all, the von Karsteins were an ancient family, 
that could trace their lineage back to the founding of the Empire. Generations later, Vlad and Isabella still presided over the lands, unchanged by the years. At first, few paid attention to their longevity. The lives of peasants had always been squalid and short, and nobles had always enjoyed vastly longer lifespans. However, when the oldest woman of Drakenhof insisted that her grandmother had been a girl when Vlad von Karstein came to the throne, even the most dim-witted peasantry began to surmise that all was not as it seemed. The spreading rumors drew more and more witch hunters to Sylvania. Those who chose to investigate the von Karsteins were never seen again. Yet worse was to come. The mysterious disease that had first laid low Isabella von Karstein struck the other noble families allied with the Count. Soon, every castle in Sylvania was home to long-lived nocturnal folk, pallid of aspect and merciless in their rule. The number of the living who went missing became more and more noticeable. The temples to Sigma, Tal, and Ulrich were closed. The priests of Mor were driven from the region, and the dead were left untended to pile up at the sides of the road. Grim watch posts were set up along the border, and few were allowed to cross either into or out of Sylvania. When catastrophe struck the Ostamar capital of Mordheim in the year 2000, Vlad was swift to act. A great meteor of warp stone had destroyed half the city, and shards of raw magic littered the ruins. As the claimants to the Imperial throne sent mercenary forces to seize this new source of power, so too did Vlad send dark minions forth into the ruins. It would be another decade before the strange seeds harvested from that blighted city would bear fruit. In his former life, Vlad was not a cruel man by heart, but the curse and selfish pride that is usually brought about by vampirism had corrupted him in body, mind, and soul. As with all vampires, the new Count of Sylvania was ambitious beyond mortal needs, and so he sought to instill his rule to not just Sylvania, but the whole of the Empire of Man. At first, None of the feuding nobles of Sylvania paid any heed to the commands of this new count. If this bothered Vlad, he gave no sign of it. He cherished his subjects the same way a peasant family would cherish a beast that they were fattening up for the midsummer feast. After decades of harsh rule by the incompetent Count Otto, this new authority was welcomed by all, save perhaps the most paranoid, or perhaps the most knowing. The first sign that something big was coming came about when the disease that first took Isabella took the rest of the Sylvanian nobility. Soon, every major castle within Sylvania was home to a family of long-living nocturnal vampires, pallid of aspect and arrogant in their rule. In time, the number of people who went missing grew to exponential numbers. A mysterious sickness, not unlike the one that had killed Otto von Drake, had filled the graveyards of Sylvania as well. 
pushing the people to their limits and forcing the majority of the peasantry to turn their backs on the gods who couldn't help them and into the arms of the cult of the Vida Auferstandenen, known by many as the Cult of the Arisen Dead. The holy temples of the old world pantheons were desecrated and closed, with the priest of Mor being driven out. Without the Mor priest to perform the proper burial rites to bring the long deceased into their tombs and towards the afterlife, the bodies of the dead were simply piling up at the sides of the road and their tormented spirits forced to live without rest. But probably the greatest and final sign of this impending darkness came when the Ostamar capital of Mor time was destroyed by a massive warp stone meteorite in the year 2000 IC. The city of Mor time was once the capital of the imperial province of Ostamar where the faithful and pious came to gather to witness the second coming of Sigmar Heldenhammer. But after some time, the city grew into a cesspit of decadence, greed, and widespread corruption. When the city was obliterated in 2000 IC by a massive meteorite, shards of warp stone were found all over the ruins of the city. Unbeknownst to its chaotic origins, claimants of the imperial throne sent mercenary companies into the city to gather as much warp stone as they possibly could, hoping to manipulate its false properties of healing the sick or turning lead into gold into their own personal uses. Vlad followed up on this as well, of course, sending in his dark minions to gather as much of the shards as they possibly could. Finally, on Geheimnisnacht Eve of the Imperial Year of 2010 IC, Vlad von Kastein thought the time ripe for the next step in his master plan. It was then, at the start of the winter, that the Count called forth all the nobles of the province to pledge loyalty to him during a festivity called the Tortentanz, or the Dance of the Dead. The dance was to be held at Drakenhof Castle at the eve of Geheimnisnacht. The Tortentanz was actually a huge coy invented by Vlad to assemble the remaining living aristocracy into one place. At the height of the ball, he gave an order to his minions to close off the entrance and kill every living thing inside. Only two people left the throne room alive. Alten Gans, loyal human servant of Vlad, who had suspected the true nature of his master plan, and Stefan Fischer, a witch hunter who had been chasing one of von Karstein's vampires for the murder of his wife alongside another witch hunter, John Skellan, his brother-in-law. During this event, Skellan was killed and turned into a vampire, but Fischer managed to hide below a pile of dead corpses without being caught. With his deed enacted, the Count of Sylvania stood upon the battlements of Castle Drakenhof and intoned a terrible incantation from one of the nine books of Nagash. Fueled by the magic saturated warp stones recovered from more time, the necromancy spell flowed over the unguarded cemeteries of the Gardens of Moor, and in an instant, all throughout the province, the dead began to stir. Slowly, every single cadaver in Sylvania began to move towards Drakenhof to answer the call of the Vampire Count. 
As the dead nobles started to emerge from the throne room, Stefan Fischer acted like a zombie and escaped Drakenhof with only one single thought in mind. They are coming. Fischer finally escaped the deadly trap Sylvania had become, only to fall into the claws of a small band of vampires traveling through the Empire. Accepting his fate, even feeling joy for being soon reunited with his wife, he was content to finally meet his end when suddenly he was saved by a small detachment of Countess Otilia's army sent to investigate reports of undead activity along the Sylvanian border. Fisher thus relayed the truth behind the Vampire Count's true nature. Feeling all sense had fled his life, he stayed with Otila's army as they tried to fend off the undead army at the Battle of Essen Ford which would be the first conflict of the Vampire Wars. The battle at Essen Ford was considered a total Imperial Massacre. Knee deep in the mud and overwhelmed by impossible odds, the human army was easily swept away. At the end of the battle, Fischer came across his brother-in-law, John Scala. When the prisoners were lined up before the Vampire Count, Vlad showed them the extent of his power. While speaking with the leader of the army detachment, he invited first Guns, then three vampires, including Skelan, to kill a prisoner of their choosing. Skelan chose Fisher and bled him dry thus reuniting him with his dead wife. Vlad reanimated each of the dead Imperials, then asked the still-living Imperial commander of this defeated army to choose one of his men to live. The latter refused, not wanting to decide about the life or death of his own. The Vampire Count thus chose the youngest of the prisoners and announced to him that he alone would live to spread the fear of the vampires throughout the Empire. Vlad then freed the prisoner who ran for his life away from the undead army. In this moment of destruction, the Imperial Commander took Vlad's sword and beheaded him with a swift stroke. Hermann Prosna severed the commander's hand in an instant afterwards, but it was too late, for the Vampire Count was no more. However, just as Prosna had finished giving orders regarding the torture of the Imperial Commander who had slain the Vampire Count, he suddenly remarked that the body of the Count had disappeared. Dismissing it as trivial, he started a brutal rise to power, slaying everyone opposing him. It had been the loyal servant Guts who had taken the body away, incapable of accepting the death of his beloved Count. At the end of the night, Krosna had obtained control of the undead army and was going to attempt to acquire the last thing that would truly cement his power, the widow Isabella. The latter, totally hysterical, was smiling when Hermann Prosna entered her tent. She claimed that her beloved wasn't dead and that he would come back to get her. Gently, Hermann Prosna led Isabella out of the tent and claimed her before the whole army as his bride, by right of strength. Then, the most unpredictable of things happened, for from the back of the crowd, someone answered the challenge. The undead all stepped away from the one who had spoken, and there stood Vlad von Karstein. 
He had been saved by a family heritage, an old signet ring obtained in his earlier life, which granted the wielder the ability to cheat death. In the following duel, Vlad defeated Prosna and laid him low. Seeing his death inevitable, Prosna hurled his sword away, killing loyal guns in the process. The Count then prepared to strike him down, but was stopped by Isabella, who claimed that right for herself. He gave his sword to her, and she killed Hermann Prosna in cold blood. The war continued after the events of Essen fought. For more than 40 years, the dark shades of the Count put an aura of terror above the Empire. Countless times he was killed in battle, and each time he rose again to kill those who had defeated him. He fell at the Battle of Bluthorn, was impaled by five lances, with the Count of Oslan's Runefang buried to the hilt in his heart, yet reappeared three days later, overseeing the execution of prisoners. Whilst at the town of Borgenhafen, he led his undead army to victory after being decapitated by a cannon only an hour before. When in the spring of 2050 IC, the city of Middenheim was attacked and the Grand Master of the Knights of the White Wolf, Jerek Kruger, was turned into a vampire because he had dared to kill the Count at the Battle of Schwarzhafen a year before. All hope seemed lost to the Imperials, and eventually the undead army marched towards the last thing between them and victory, the Imperial capital of Altdor. When the undead army arrived before the walls of Altdorf, they found the city was well prepared. The Reich had been diverted to surround the city, harvests had been entered, and the walls had been manned. However, the powers of Vlad proved enormous. In a shocking display of cabalistic power, he covered the sky in clouds and awoke every dead beneath the plains surrounding Altdorf. Huge siege engines formed of zombies were thrown against the city walls, and in time, the number of dead soon outnumbered those of the living. There was no hope of victory for mankind. In search of divine aid, the Grand Theogenist Wilhelm III retreated into the catacombs of the Cathedral of Altdorf to pray. It was in that holy place that he received a visit from none other than Manfred von Karstein, the eldest thrall of Vlad. Manfred wanted the power of the Vampire Count for himself, but he knew that he wasn't strong enough to challenge Vlad in combat. So he informed Wilhelm III about the secret of the Count's immortality. The priest then set out an elaborated trap to catch the best thief of this very age, Felix Mann. When they finally caught him robbing the Imperial Counting House, they gave him a simple choice to rob Vlad von Karstein's signet ring, or to be hung for his crimes. In reward of the theft, he would be paid enough to start a living elsewhere. Felix accepted the theft and, with a little aid from Manfred von Karstein, robbed the Count of his most precious belonging. When the Count awakened, his anger was uncontrollable. In one frantic attack, Vlad threw everything he had against Altdorf. There, on the battlements, he confronted Wilhelm III and eventually overcame him. However, with his last breath, 
the great Theotonist threw himself against the undead count, and both fell off the walls. While the fall wouldn't have killed a vampire as powerful as Vlad, they both fell on a wooden stake, the vampire trapped beneath the corpse of the holy man. With the death of Vlad, his army dissolved and the old Dorfers rejoiced, for finally, the horrors of the first vampire war were finally over. I fell in love with him the moment I met him. There was something about him, his eyes, the way he carried himself, as if he were something more than human, even when he was still mortal. From Queen Neferata, Vlad von Karstein was the first and greatest of the Vampire Counts of Sylvania. A master swordsman and skilled general with no small aptitude in the magical arts. It was he who tainted the aristocracy of Sylvania with the curse of vampirism, and in so doing created an undead kingdom in the heart of the Empire. Count Vlad was a towering figure with a mane of long hair and piercing eyes. Those who met him and survived described him as possessed of a feral charm, but with an evil temper that could turn into a berserk fury if he was thwarted in his endeavors. It was said that at such times, only his wife, Isabella, could calm him without blood being spilled. No records tell of the origins of Vlad before his coming to Sylvania. Even the vampires of that realm know nothing of Vlad's life before that fateful night in Drakenhof, and Vlad certainly never recounted or wrote down his personal history. That he knew much about the workings of the Empire and its internal division at the time of his arrival attests to knowledge of the dealings of mortal men for many years. A few had perhaps amassed small forces and carved out far-flung domains, but it was Vlad's usurpation of Sylvania and his ascendancy to the position of Count that marked a new era of bloodshed. As the first true vampire Count, Vlad had designs not only to create a realm of the dead, but also to secure dominion over the living. Vlad waged his war in order to become emperor, for he truly believed he had a legitimate claim to the throne. With the might of the Empire at his command, and Isabella at his side, he would have become one of the most powerful rulers in the world. That he came so close to achieving his ambition should have been a dire warning to the other Elector Counts, but they forgot the lessons of the First War and fell to bickering amongst themselves again, paving the way for Vlad's unholy successors who assail the Empire to this day. When the darkness falls, our time is at hand. We are the rulers of the night. We are the predators of the shadows. Come hither, and we will show you the true meaning of terror. Conrad von Karstein, known by many names such as Conrad the Butcher, Conrad the Bloody, and Conrad the Beast, was an infamously violent and martial vampire count of Sylvania, known from the annals of history for his cruelty, corruption, and complete insanity. There are few things more dangerous than a violent lunatic, 
but one of them is an immortal, violent lunatic with the strength and speed of a vampire. Adding a literal thirst for blood to Conrad's figurative mindset did little for the noble's stretched sanity. The first of the von Karsteins had considered this as a potential advantage, and Conrad was one of the last of the von Karsteins to be embraced into the family. Perhaps his complete lack of scruples and his tenuous grasp on reality amused Vlad and assured that he could never truly be a legitimate threat to his rule, unlike his deviously cunning son in darkness, Manfred. In retrospect, however, it might have better served his dynasty if Vlad had simply cut off Conrad's head when the chance first presented itself. His insane depravity resulted in far more harm than good for his dynasty. Once given the blood kiss, Conrad made no attempt to hide his supernatural powers and fed openly on his friends and subjects, as well as rats, cats, cows, wandering peddlers, and anything else with a pulse that came too close. Conrad appointed himself as something of a berserk enforcer for Vlad executing anyone who displeased the Count. This naturally also included anyone who displeased Conrad. Over time, this encompassed many victims, including enemy generals, priests of all descriptions, people with a squint, and several necromancers who had laughed at Conrad's pitiful magical skills. The sun and the silver cannot harm us. Not if we will them not to. Not if we truly believe they will not. From Conrad von Karstein. After their leader, Vlad von Karstein was killed by the Grand Theogenist Wilhelm III at the Siege of Altdorf. The surviving vampires fled back to Sylvania. Five vampires came to be the heir of Vlad. Fritz, Hans, Peter, Conrad, and Manfred von Karstein. For more than 40 years afterwards, the vampires of the von Karstein line fought a vicious power struggle, giving the Empire vital time to recover from the desolation brought about by Vlad's invasion. In time, Fritz von Karstein was killed on the field of battle while foolishly attempting to besiege the mile-high fortress city of Middenheim. Hans von Karstein perished when Conrad instigated a quarrel with him over who was the toughest among them. Peter was slain in his coffin by a vengeful witch hunter by the name of Helmut von Hahn a distant descendant of the vampire himself. It is said that Manfred von Karstein had also aided in his death. After Peter's death, Manfred von Karstein disappeared from Sylvania, leaving Conrad as the new, undisputed ruler of all Sylvania. In time, Conrad had purposefully enacted the second Vampire War. Whilst Vlad von Karstein was patient yet ambitious, Conrad von Karstein was simply a mad butcher, evil, merciless, and insanely violent. Lacking the necromantic skills of his predecessor, he was forced to enslave any magicians he could capture and force them to do his bidding as powerful necromancers. Once more, the vampire counts of Sylvania rampage across the lands of the Empire, bloodthirsty in their advance and showing no mercy. Indeed, 
Conrad is beyond bloodthirsty, even amongst his own kind. Whilst Vlad offered his opponents a choice between life and death, Conrad offered them a choice between dying quickly or dying slowly. Whilst Vlad's ambition was to rule as the Vampire Emperor of the Empire, Conrad's motive was to simply indulge himself in bloody violence. His warmongering nature took his army far to the south, where he came into contact with the Knights of the Blood Keep and the bearers of the Blood Dragon bloodline. With these knights folding into his ranks, Conrad was able to destroy all those who would dare to oppose him. Despite his mediocre strategic planning, hysteria, and grave tactical errors. At Kleiberstorf, however, Conrad faced a powerful Avalander army that contained a massive battery of long-range artillery. When battle commenced, the Avalander artillery rained down barrage after barrage against the slow-moving Sylvanian army. In desperation, Conrad both threatened, bribed, and pleaded with his necromancers to keep his army moving forward. He offered power and riches to his captive wizards, and they acceded, combining their powers to unleash a scourging wind on the Avaland army. Dark magic swept across the Imperial ranks, and in short time, the Imperial soldiers began to feel their souls being clawed from ethereal hands. Panic began to spread as the unnatural gale began to slay more and more soldiers. In a moment of rare clarity, Conrad saw that the moment was ripe for an attack and sent forth his elite force of Blood Knights and Drakenhof Templars into the fray. Faced with insubstantial terrors and armored vampires, the Avaland army broke and fled. Conrad, like the bloodthirsty creature he is, hounded the Imperial soldiers for five days and five nights ensuring that all those that had participated in the battle were hunted down and killed to the last. In his overzealous pride and need to draw more blood, the Vampire Count had instigated a bloody war with the dwarfs against the cautious advice of his few counselors. Attacking isolated villages and surface settlements at the foothills of the mountain stronghold of Zufbar, the king of the hold itself had finally had enough and mustered a grand army to punish the vampire once and for all. Seeing a new challenge, the vampire met the dwarf army at the town of Nachthafen. In the battle, the dwarven rune smiths countered the necromantic spells of Conrad's enslaved necromancers with ease. Robbed of their sustaining power, the skeleton warriors and zombies of Conrad's army lay where they fell, blasted apart by a horrific barrage of cannons and mortar artillery. Conrad remained confident despite the setbacks and launched an all-out assault on the dwarf's right flank. Leading the assault himself, the vampire drove directly into the Carter of Runesmiths whilst his blood knight smashed into the disciplined ranks of dwarf warriors. Conrad slew the Runesmiths personally, drinking their spilt blood and giving his captive necromancers the time they needed to resurrect the fallen. It was a hopeless battle, but the dwarves still fought stubbornly until the very end. Their own king had challenged the Blood Count in personal combat, but instead, Conrad dispatched Valach Harkon, the Grand Master of the Blood Knights, to fight as his champion. Though the duel was bitter close, the Grand Master finally killed the Dwarf King and gorged himself on the royal blood. 
Within the next hour, the dwarves were all dead. Conrad was so unwaveringly vicious in his undead assault that confronted with a common enemy, the three claimants to the Imperial throne had put aside their differences and combined their armies into one mighty force. At the Battle of the Four Armies, the three Imperial Grand Armies united their forces against the undead army of Conrad just outside the fortress city of Middenheim. This battle became infamously known for the great betrayal enacted by the three Imperial leaders. Emperor Ludwig and Empress Attila IV vied to assassinate each other during the battle. A disgusting gesture that forced the other Imperial nobles to select another candidate to lead this new coalition. A conclave of the Elector Counts assembled themselves within Averheim, where they decided that Helmut of Marienburg would be a prime candidate to be the new Emperor. Even as support for him grew within the Council Hall, Helmut began to act erratically, struck dumb and vacant at a critical time. In an infamous event, Helmut's skin began to peel off and his eyes suddenly popped out of his own skull. Even Helmut's son, Helmar, refused his father's claim to the throne once it was discovered that his father was killed and turned into a zombie under Conrad's control. With his ploy failing, Conrad threw into a rage and slaughtered his way from Averheim into the Howling Hills, putting to the torch every town and village that stood in his way. Finally, having had enough of Conrad's sadistic invasion, all of the remaining Elector Counts and Dwarf Lords joined forces once more upon the Battle of Grim Moor during the spring of 2121 IC. Arrogantly, Conrad once more attacked in a headlong charge against the fully arrayed armies of all the Elector Counts and the Dwarf Warriors under the legendary Dwarf hero Grufbad. Although his Blood Knights were able to endure the punishment, a strange event began to occur. In that instant, the regiments of the undead began to falter, with the dark magic that bound them together being seeped away. It finally dawned that Conrad's necromancers had also had enough of Conrad's cruel rulership and betrayed him in that most critical moment. Seeing the battle as lost, the terrified Blood Knights fled the battlefield as well. In desperation, the magically inept Conrad tried to hold the undead army together. But the effort proved too much to bear, and in an instant, what little of Conrad's mind and sanity remained had finally snapped. In a mad fit, Conrad wandered away from the battle as his undead army began to disintegrate, shouting maniacally at this most cruelest of jokes. As Conrad wandered the forest aimlessly, Grofbad captured Conrad and held him down while Elector Count Helmar impaled his father's killer with his runefang. With Conrad's death, the Second Vampire War was finally over, and in time, the Elector Counts began to squabble amongst themselves once more. This land is my home, my birthright. The wind and rain are my allies. The trees and stones are my foot soldiers. The very earth will rise up against you, should you try to take it from me. And my people will feast on your bones. 
Manfred von Karstein, known in his younger years as Manfred the Acolyte, is the most cunning and magically gifted vampire of all of the von Karstein bloodline. He claims the hereditary title as the Vampire Count of Sylvania, a title that is only given to the first of his bloodline. Imbued with staggering magical power, Manfred von Karstein has managed, through sheer ambition and willpower, to accumulate all the spells from the Lord of the Vampires and the Lord of Necromancy after spending the better part of a century collecting the forbidden knowledge from the sand-encrusted libraries of ancient Nehekara. Like many of his vampiric kind, he has led the armies of Sylvania to war on many occasions. His mastery of the necromantic arts sustaining his army far beyond their normal potential. In addition to his necromantic abilities, he is also a highly skilled swordsman. In battle, Manfred carries his ancient sword Geistfor, a powerful two-handed weapon that allows the bearer to absorb and drink the blood of the slain, giving him the ability to rejuvenate himself while amplifying his control over the winds of magic. He also wears the armor of Tempelhof, an ancient battle armor that protects the bearer from harm and further enhances his already extraordinary endurance. Befitting a lord of his status, Manfred von Karstein is an extremely cunning politician. He knows full well the extent and complexity of his position as Vampire Count. For although he claims dominion from all the von Karsteins, he knows that each of his subjects are far too fiercely independent to properly control. Thus, he needs to be a cunning creature, as well as a warrior, using bribery, assassination, and diplomacy, rather than outright conquest, to secure the allegiance of his many rebellious subjects. This combination of magic, cunning, and martial skill makes Manfred a foe that will continue to leave a nightmarish mark upon the annals of the Empire's history for many years to come. Manfred von Karstein was sired by Vlad von Karstein in the days before his arrival at Drakenhof Castle and his marriage to the Count's daughter, Isabella von Drac. Out of all the vampires of the First Bloodline, Manfred held a greater claim to his sire's throne than any other contender, but chose to remain in the shadows, letting the other claimants destroy themselves before he assumed full control of Sylvania. During Vlad's invasion of the Empire, he helped his war effort by destroying the ruling family of Nuln in a single night's blood feast. After his mission was accomplished, he felt that his time of servitude to Vlad was done. He sent the young vampire John Skelan to return to Sylvania, where he would serve as Manfred's agent in stoking the raging paranoia of Manfred's blood brother, Conrad von Karstein. When asked why he did not simply betray Conrad and seize power for himself, he did not reveal his intentions. Instead, he simply reminded John Skelan that should he attempt to usurp power for himself, the next von Karstein he would face would be Manfred himself. By this time, 
Manfred had decided that he could not live in the shadow of Vlad any longer, and plotted to aid in his assassination. He wanted the power of the Vampire Count for himself, but he knew that he wasn't strong enough to challenge Vlad in combat. He informed the Grand Theatonist Wilhelm III about the secret of the Count's immortality. The priest then set out an elaborate trap to catch the best thief of this very age, Felix Mann. When they finally caught him robbing the Imperial Counting House, they gave him a simple choice. Rob Vlad von Karstein's signal ring, or be hanged for his crimes. His reward for the theft would be payment enough to start a living elsewhere. Felix accepted the theft, and with a little aid from Manfred, robbed the Count of his most precious belonging. When the Count awakened to find his ring missing, his anger was uncontrollable. In one frantic attack, Vlad threw everything he had against Altdorf. There on the battlements, he confronted Wilhelm III and eventually overcame him. However, with his last breath, the Grand Theodorist threw himself against the undead Count, and both fell off the city walls. While the fall wouldn't have killed a vampire as powerful as Vlad, they both fell on a wooden stake, the vampire trapped beneath the corpse of the holy man. With the death of Vlad, his army dissolved and the old Dorfers rejoiced. All the horrors of the first vampire war were finally over. In the immediate aftermath, Felix Munn, wanting to claim his reward, discovered that with no physical proof of the deal he had with the Grand Theogenist, nobody would believe he had committed a theft on behalf of a holy man. Wronged and angered, Felix stole one of Vlad's books of Nagash. However, while fleeing from the Sigmarites, he became conscious that someone was following him from the shadows. When he was finally cornered by the stranger in a back alley, he tried to buy him off with the dead Count's signet ring. The stranger, who was, in fact, Manfred von Karstein severed both wrists of the thief, took the ring and the book, and left Felix for dead. With his mission accomplished, Manfred journeyed south to Nehekara, wandering Kemri and the other dead cities, where he procured much necromantic lore from the stolen books of the Gaj and the few tomb kings willing to deal with him. In time, he became more powerful in his magical abilities than Vlad von Karstein had ever been. With the death of Conrad during the Second Vampire War, the last contender for Vlad's position was Manfred von Karstein. Whilst Vlad was the most powerful, and Conrad was the most violent and bloodthirsty, he was by far the most cunning and magically gifted of the entire bloodline. By the time Manfred returned to Castle Drakenhof to acquire and cement his claim as the new Vampire Count, he soon possessed an entire library of dark lore. With the last of the first von Karstein bloodline dead, Manfred became the undisputed ruler of Sylvania. For a full decade afterwards, he bided his time wisely and allowed the Imperial contenders to believe that the threat posed by Sylvania was truly over. Where Vlad ruled through his iron will and raw power, and Conrad reigned with fear, 
Mumfred used his necromantic powers and devious manipulations to forge his new undead armies. He sought out vampires from beyond the borders of Sylvania and bribed, coerced, and flattered them into joining his new retinue. He spent many long months in the wilderness of the Empire, rousing spirits and whites from their decrepit tombs. When a vicious civil war once again wrecked the Empire, he deemed it was time to finally strike. His undead legions crossed the Sylvanian border in the depths of winter, as the cold does little harm to the flesh of the dead. With the summer campaigning season over, the armies of the Elector Counts were already disbanded and wholly unprepared for the sudden assault. Manfred's armies marched through the snow towards Altdorf, putting to the sword any living man they met and raising the corpses to swell the ranks of his horde. In the infamous Winter War of 2132, he defeated several hastily assembled Imperial armies that attempted to block his path. Victory followed victory, and soon the dark rumor of his coming was enough to send villages fleeing from their homes only to freeze to death in the snow. When Manfred's massive legions reached Altdorf, they found the city seemingly undefended. Triumph filled him. He looked set to become not a vampire count, but a vampire emperor, achieving what both Vlad and Conrad had failed to do. Then, the Grand Theogenist, Kurt, the third appeared on the battlement of the city. The Sigmarite High Priest had brought forth the evil Liber Mortis from the deepest locked vaults of his temple, and he began to recite the great spell of unbinding from its pages. As the incantation continued, Manfred's power over his minions began to weaken. Seeing his followers crumbling to dust, he ordered a hasty retreat, for the hidden Imperial armies within Altdorf were mobilizing for a massive counterattack. Undeterred, Manfred marched his army along the River Reich, downstream and into the port city of Marienburg capturing several large vessels along the way and manning them with the raised corpses of their crews. His initial plan was to lay siege to the port city and then sail his zombie fleet through Marienburg's primary rivers and canals that split the city in half and attack from the river ports. In desperation, the entire city was roused to the defense and in time, the first undead assault upon the ports was repulsed. Unable to make a beachhead within the riverways, Manfred began construction of a massive siege tower and catapults within the outskirts of the city. However, scouts had reported to him that a massive imperial army was hounding them all the way from the city of Altdor. Realizing he couldn't win this siege, he promptly retreated. And so began a long cat and mouse chase that encircled the entire empire of man, with neither side entirely sure which one was the cat. At Horstenbad, the army of Rostamark was able to surround and ambush Manfred as his army wound its way along the forest road, destroying nearly half of his forces. Yet Manfred escaped the slaughter, and within the month had seized the town of Felf and created a new army. 
On and on the campaign rage, with neither side able to secure the ultimate victory. Twice Manfred was forced to retreat to Sylvania in order to escape pursuit from his relentless enemies. Determined not to make the same mistakes as they had before, the nobility of the Empire had sworn a truce among themselves to finally rid the Empire of Man of the Vampire Threat once and for all. United under a righteous cause, the entire military might of the Empire was brought to bear with forces being mustered from all the Grand Provinces for the Sylvanian Campaign. To settle past grudges, the High King of the Dwarfs had also sent in armies of heavily armored warriors into the fighting. Wave after wave of Imperial armies streamed into the Sylvanian borders like a massive flood, and soon the relentless Imperials had forced Munfred into a pitched battle known famously as the Battle of Hellfen. The Count's army was vast, his necromantic power having raised a legion of zombies from the muddy depths of Hellfen itself. His unliving host continued to retreat deeper into the swamps, drawing the exhausted Imperial armies onwards into the filth and gloom. Yet Manfred had not accounted for the determination of his foes. Tirelessly, the Imperial and Dwarven armies hounded him like bloodthirsty wolves until finally he was brought into battle at the eastern reach of the marshlands, where the warriors of the Empire and the Dwarves fought with grim resolve. The Vampire Count saw that victory was beyond him, and attempted to flee. Elector Count Martin of Stirland, mounted upon a majestic griffon, gave chase and caught Manfred at the very edge of the swamps. Though the Elector Count was wounded badly, his rune fang cleaved great gouges into Manfred's flesh, and the vampire's mangled corpse sank into the depths of the swamp. Despite a long search, neither man nor dwarf ever located Manfred's body. Thus ended the reign of Manfred, the last of the von Karsteins, and the final end of the Vampire Wars once and for all. I urge your holiness to alert his majesty the emperor to the danger. If I am right, we are all in dire peril, and it will be only a matter of time before the armies of the vile undead strike west against Stirland and Ostland, as they did 300 years ago. From Witch Hunter Captain Gunther Stahlberg, in a letter to the Grand Theogenist, written while in Sylvania. My Lord von Karstein, we recovered this letter before it could reach the safety of Stirland. I felt that your Lordship would find it amusing. Writing found in the previously quoted letter. Although Manfred truly died upon the Battle of Helfen, an odd turn of events came about that returned him from the grave. A necromancer by the name of Stillman, a former member of the Necromancer Order of the Charnel Congress, attempted to resurrect him as an act of revenge for his banishment. Just as the necromancer was about to sacrifice an innocent soul for his ritual, Stillman was suddenly killed by a pursuing group of hunters, of which included the famous duo Gotrek and Felix. As the hunting party foolishly left his body intact instead of burning it, 
The blood of the necromancer dripped loosely from his corpse and flowed into the roots of a tree from which Manfred's body laid. With enough blood entering his body, Manfred was able to rise once more. He was hell-bent on taking the imperial throne for himself and ruling over the old world, even if it took an eternity to do so. Ever since, he has bided his time. Over the years leading up to his re-emergence, he traveled far and wide to secure allies. His studies with the disciples of Nagash in the ruins of Lahmia completed, his magical abilities had never been stronger. Yet the von Karstein's plans were ambitious indeed. In return for their secrets, Manfred had sworn a dread pact with the corrupted wraith wizards that yet serve Nagash in the south. A pact to aid them in their goal of summoning the great necromancer once more and bringing a new order to the world. The von Karsteins had secretly been working towards this same goal for centuries following the death of the rebellious Vlad von Karstein, whom personally betrayed Nagash when he invaded the Empire during the reign of Emperor Sigma and had tried to stop this summoning ever since. Though great progress had been made, their efforts had ultimately fallen short, for in truth, Nagash had become more like a god than a man and his spirit was beyond even the abilities of the Vampire Counts to bring to the mortal realm. It would take the rituals of ancient Nehekara combined with the sacrifice of a powerful and innocent soul to achieve a true resurrection. Manfred, in his genius, saw a way to hasten the return of Nagash and seriously weaken those who would stand against him in one stroke. He enlisted Heinrich Kemmler and his servant Krell to aid him. When Aliafra, the princess of the High Elves, went on a diplomatic trip to increase relations between dwarves and High Elves, Kemmler manipulated tribes of orcs and goblins into attacking the fortress. When the elves and dwarves defeated the Greenskins, Kemmler raised the corpses of the Fallen and sent his own army after them. The two armies were decimated, with Thane Ogrim slain and the bodies of the defenders shambling after Kemmler as his new servants. The lover of Aliafra, Prince Eluthian, was badly injured by Manfred himself during an aerial battle, and Aliafra was knocked out and taken into the claws of a terror geist. She was taken far from the lands of the dwarves into the heart of Sylvania, where she was locked away while Manfred prepared a resurrection ritual. He expected the dwarves and high elves to go to war, thinking they'd blame each other. Indeed, nobles in Ulthuan and dwarf longbeards called for war to redeem their honor. However, Phoenix King Finobar and High King Thorgrim Grudgebearer were determined to avoid another fruitless war. Finobar was a diplomat at heart and knew that the dwarves were a honorable race and as the keeper of the Book of Grudges, Thorgrim knew when a grudge was warranted and when it wasn't. Alariel, the Radiant of the High Elves, sensed that Aliafra was still alive, and thus she called upon her past and present lovers, Finobar and Tyrion respectively, to get her daughter back. Finobar immediately went to the dwarves to secure an alliance against the vampires, and Tyrion gathered a glorious all-cavalry army to ride against Manfred. 
Manfred himself was preparing to sacrifice Aliathra to complete a futile resurrection ritual. Then, Tyrion broke into his fortress of Nagashizar, found the unresponsive princess, and rode out with her. As his men were leaving, they witnessed an enormous undead army rising up out of the ground from all directions as far as the eye could see. Tyrion led the elves as they tried to fight their way out before some unexpected help came. High King Thorgrim cared little about the elves' well-being. But since it was a matter of honor, he gathered an army and followed Munfred all the way to Nagashizar. The dwarves hit the rear of his army just as the elves hit the front. They killed the necromancers that kept bringing back the undead. But Munfred recaptured Eliathra when Tyrion was distracted and used his magic to flee with her. Tyrion, distraught by this, Blame Thorgrim for their failures in rescuing the elven princess. In a surprising show of tolerance and peacekeeping, Thorgrim stood his ground, knowing that his people held the moral ground in this confrontation, and to rekindle the War of the Beards would have led to only more misery. Instead, the High King told Tyrion that the next time he tried to rescue Aliafra, the dwarves would not be there to aid them, and soon marched off with his army towards Karak Eight Peaks. Kill them, my slaves, from Manfred von Karstein. At some point after his resurrection, Manfred allied himself with the newly risen Dread King, a former Dark Lord of Nagash. The Vampire Lord began a mining operation underneath Drakenhof in search of warpstone for his master. However, he soon made the mistake of kidnapping a young noblewoman, who was revealed to be the cousin of none other than Karl Franz himself. Having sworn an oath to protect her, the army of the famed Grudgebringers delved into the vampire's minds, where they clashed with his undead hordes in a fierce battle. The Emperor's cousin was ultimately rescued, and Manfred himself was believed once more to be slain. <laughs> Please, come in and join me for dinner. I can see from the way you dress, you are a man of exquisite taste. From Isabella. Isabella von Karstein, or Isabella von Drag, wife to Vlad von Karstein, was one of the first vampires of the von Karstein bloodline and the apparent heir to the county of Sylvania. Isabella von Drag was the only daughter of Otto von Drag, the ruler of Sylvania. Isabella was much like many of her noble counterparts. She was vain, immoral, and selfish, and cared little for anything that did not affect her personal comfort and standing. Though very intelligent, she had a classical rather than practical education. She was considered somewhat strained for her love of some of the more male pursuits, such as hunting and falconry, over needlework and music. In fact, outside of Sylvania, the only thing that made Isabella vaguely desirable as a wife was her stunning, cold beauty. 
This, however, was not enough to tempt suitors worthy of inheriting the throne of Sylvania, and Mad Otto certainly did not wish to give her hand to any of his rivals within the province. When Vlad von Karstein arrived on the night of Otto's death, Isabella was pleased that creepy old Uncle Leopold would not inherit, though she was far from happy at having to marry this sinister stranger. As the months passed, however, what had started out as a marriage of convenience developed into something far more. When it became clear that Isabella could not be merely seduced by his charms and rebelled against his will for the first time, Vlad fell instantly in love with her. Vlad long resisted Isabella's requests to join him in undeath. He simply loved her too much for her to endure all that. But when she lay dying from a fatal wasting illness, he realized that he could not carry on without her, and reluctantly inducted her into the ranks of the undead. As a vampire, Countess Isabella was forever at Vlad's side, feeding his ambition and teaching him the ways of the Sylvanian court and about the wider empire. She was Vlad's most valued confidant, and the only person, living or dead, whose advice he trusted. When Vlad set forth on his mission to become Emperor, Isabella accompanied him on the road to war. She carried an heirloom of the von Drags with her, a chalice made for her great-grandmother, Countess Bathory. Corrupted by dark magic, this golden goblet was forever filled with fresh blood, from which Isabella drank even in the midst of the fiercest fighting. Those who dared confront her in battle would stare wide-eyed as her wounds healed within seconds, time seeming to flow backwards for the life vampire countess as blood crawled back into open veins and alabaster flesh neatly sealed in its wake. Their hesitation would invariably cost them dearly. For when they returned to their senses, they would invariably find their throat slit or a sword driven right through their chests. It is claimed that when Vlad died, Isabella was fighting atop one of the gate towers of Altdorf. Protected by a ring of grave guard, she battled against the self-declared Emperor Ludwig and his great swords. When the whites suddenly collapsed around her, Isabella realized that her beloved had been finally destroyed, and his necromantic power was undone. So stricken was she that she turned from the men battling against her and flung herself from the tower. Her body was impaled on the stakes below, before crumbling into dust. <laughs>